This is talk show Housebot and I'm Peter Horky. Welcome to a special meeting. 40 years ago, my guest has changed the world's perception of pregnancy and childbirth. Professor Thomas Verney is a Canadian psychiatrist who specializes in prenatal and perinatal psychology. He studied in Toronto and at Harvard. In the 90s, he published a groundbreaking book, The Secret Life of Unborn Child, which provoked a storm of reactions to phenomena we now consider natural. It must be written in Professor Verney's destiny that he is ahead of the times and its habits with his discoveries, because in recent years he has attracted attention in scientific forums when he talks about the need to finally understand that the vast amount of information we used to expect to find only in the brain is also carried by our cells throughout the body. Look at his latest book, The Embodied Mind. I would be very happy if you would join in discussion after watching the video. You may have interesting stories, opinions and views of your own. If you give me a like or subscription, it will help me to spread my videos further. And now listen to the scientific discoveries of a Harvard professor, which are changing even today's established rules of our brain and body. Well, I'm a psychiatrist and I'm an author and I lecture, and I have a podcast, and I write blogs for psychology today. I do many, 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 many things. But oh. most, yeah, in, in the past, the last 40 years or so, I was very much involved in pre- and perinatal psychology, the psychology of the unborn child, the newborn child, the psychology of pregnancy, and then seven years ago, I moved away from that into cellular consciousness. And we can talk about that. All right. But if you don't mind, I I'll, I would like to ask you about the beginning of uh, your moment when you start to focus in on psychology before leaving the mother's belly. Uh, <laughs> I like the story of the conductor that yeah. you have met many years ago. Please, can you say it? Yes, well, uh, that was <clears throat> that was one of the many incidents that put me on the path to explore pre and perinatal psychology, because there was a very well known conductor in Canada. He was conductor of a symphony orchestra in in Hamilton, which is a pretty big town by Canadian standards, uh, and. Uh, he was being interviewed, like we are right now, actually. He was being interviewed on the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And towards the end of the interview, um, when I think the interviewer ran out of questions, uh, she said to him, well, Mr. Broad, when do you think your musical career started? And he said, I think it started in my mother's womb. Well, that was that was very new. Like this is the nineteen late nineteen seventies. Like this is fifty years ago. So this was a little bit shocking. And uh, the interviewer said, "Well, what do you mean by that?" So anyway, uh, so the uh, Boris Brod, Boris Brod said, "Well, you see, sometimes when I was just starting to conduct." Uh, the cello line would jump out at me. Before I even turned the page, I sort of intuitively knew what the next few notes will be. So he thought that that was a little bit strange. And so he talked to his mother about this. Uh, he, he was a young man and she was still alive. And she said to him, well, what are the pieces that you are that you're conducting that seems so familiar. And he told her what it was. And she said, well, that was exactly, that was exactly the piece that I was rehearsing on my cello. She was a cello player while I was pregnant with you. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the incidents that kind of made me think like what's going on here. Um, the, the one that really sort of the very first one that got me going. May I tell you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, 
I was just a young psychiatrist and uh, I was very much interested in dreams, which is sort of another story because I got into dreams when I was 13 years old in Vienna. Um, but I was very much interested since the age of 13, since I read uh, Sigmund Freud's interpretation of dreams. In so 13 I, years, not knowing German language with a dictionary in your hand. That's, I, that's something special. <laughs> Right, that's right. You you heard this story before, and so uh, yeah. So uh, here I was with a young man, and uh, we were discussing his dream, and suddenly, he started crying like a little baby. And I did not interfere, and after about ten minutes, he came out of it, and I asked him what happened, and he said he had just found himself in a crib in a baby crib, and he was crying for his mother. Then he said, being a somewhat skeptical young lawyer, actually, then he said, you know, there's something wrong with this experience that I just had, because I've actually seen pictures of myself as a baby in a crib, and that crib was blue, I swear, he said, that that, that was a blue crib. And the one that I've just found myself in right now was white. So I said, well, go home to your mother and perhaps she can throw some light on this. So next week he came back and he said, this is absolutely amazing. But it seems that when I was born, my parents were very poor. They did not have enough money to buy me a crib. And so they borrowed a crib from a neighbor and that crib was white. And then a few months later, somehow they got some money together. They bought me a new crib. That crib was blue. And that's the one where all the photographs were taken. So there was no way, there was no way this young man could have known. I mean, these are not things that parents discuss with their children, right? So there was no way. So that was the very first experience, actually, that got me thinking. But you see, I was very well educated. I went to the University of Toronto, which is one of the best medical schools, certainly in Canada. Uh, I went to Harvard in Boston. So everywhere I went, we were taught that children before the age of two do not remember anything. And so we were, we were brainwashed to believe, to believe that. But when I started having my very own experiences, then I thought, well, perhaps, you know, perhaps all that orthodoxy is wrong. And so that's what got me involved in doing more and more research about pre and perinatal life and eventually led to the writing of the book, The Secret Life of the Unborn Child, uh, that beyond all expectations, honestly, you know, if I would have sold 5,000 books, I would have been happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond all expectations, it just kind of stormed its way into the world. And, and people are still reading it. And it has been published in 27 countries. So it has been a huge success. And it has really influenced my life tremendously because it has given me great opportunities to travel and to talk about these things and to meet interesting people. So it has been a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. uh, your book, we probably know it. And uh, your book was really uh, maybe, but I don't know exactly if you know it, because it was distributed, for example, in Czechoslovakia during a communist time as a prohibited book that people personally rewrite it. And the special original copy translated to Czech language and Slovak language has been distributed just among the people to, to share the information. So your book has unbelievable story. I, I didn't know that. So it was kind of an underground bestseller. Exactly, exactly. So you have a lot of money in Czech market to gain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm coming in two weeks to collect it. So it will be the, the right time. Great. <laughs> I, I want to say, uh, I'm sure that many people would uh, say uh, some interesting family stories, how father remembered something that is impossible to remember because he was too small. And I believe that many scientists have heard it. But you was the first who said, oh, 
there is something special that I should focus on. And it needs a courage to go against just the system of that time. Yes, yes, it does. It uh, takes a, a lot of courage. Uh, you have to you have to swim against the stream. That's it. Uh, when I, I I published a small paper um, in in a medical journal, uh, which essentially said that uh, that drinking during pregnancy is uh, is bad for for the baby that you are carrying. Well, you have no idea. Uh, the hostility that that sort of brought about by obstetricians and gynecologists and other doctors, uh, they they stopped subscribing to that magazine. They were so upset with me, um, and that's just one of many many examples. And then, of course, you know there were quite a few feminists who said, "Oh, here is another man who is telling us." how we should treat our bodies, which was not what I was saying at all. I was just saying that if you want to have a healthy child, you better stop smoking and you better stop drinking, which today is pretty well, you know, yep. accepted. But at that time, this is early 1980s, it was not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I actually, you know, without, without trying to sound too full of myself, but I, I have I have instituted some important changes in society as a result of my work. Yeah, definitely, yes. There is no discussion about that. Uh, tell me, uh, what did you found out about the psychic life of unborn child? So what is happening and when? Well, um, that's a very, very good question. So when, um, now by psychic, I mean, psych, I, I mean, cognition, intellectual, mm -hmm. think, okay, not the psychics who can perhaps, you know, uh, read, uh, I don't know, tea leaves or something like that, okay. Um, so when I, w when I wrote the book, um, which I think was 1981 that it was published, uh, I collected pretty well all the information that I could. Uh, luckily, I spoke German because I spent three years in Vienna. <laughs> Excuse me. I spent three years in Vienna. So eventually, I, I picked up German, although I didn't know any when I first arrived in Vienna. Um, so I was able to read German and, of course, English. Uh, and so I was able to read a lot of literature and put everything together that was known at that time that was scientifically sound. And to make a long story short, what I found was that certainly by the age of six months after conception, six months after conception during the last trimester, and of course there are some differences between children, um, but by and large, by the end of the six months, uh, children are, are definitely sensitive. Like by this, I mean they are sensitive to light, to sound mm -hmm. and uh, to touch, all those things, they are sensitive, but they're also sensible. Uh, there is a certain degree of brain work going on. For example, we can see REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. Mm -hmm. And so if there is rapid eye movement sleep, then that means that the children are dreaming. Mm -hmm. You may very well ask, what are they dreaming about? Well, that really is not that difficult because what they're dreaming about is is their experiences. So, for example, children have been seen to suck their thumb in utero. Mm -hmm. uh, children, when they are awake, uh, can hear what's going on outside. They, of course, can hear the placental circulation. They can listen to the heartbeat of the mother. Uh, there is a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on. And they will be dreaming about that. And we know that they are dreaming because the RAM sleep shows that they are dreaming. Then we can also talk to children. Um, the best time, by the way, and this is this is such an interesting experience, you know, mm -hmm. and many, many of your listeners can find out for themselves. They, if you have a child sometime between, somewhere between the ages of two and a half and four and a half, when you give them a bath and they are very relaxed uh, in a very sort of non-directive way without 
implying that this is really uh, important to you. You just say, do you remember anything about your birth? That's all you have to say. And you will be amazed at the information that comes out of those children. Uh, not every child is going to tell you, but many of them will. And I have many reports of children talking to their parents at bath time. And why at bath time? Firstly, because it helps to relax them. And secondly, because it takes them back to the amniotic universe, it takes them back to mother's womb where they are swimming in water in the amniotic sac, right? So it sort of gently regresses them non-verbally, which is important. And so, you know, to, uh, I, I have, for example, one letter from a woman who, who wrote me after reading The Secret Life. And she said to her child, do you remember my, do you remember the, the, the pajamas I wore? And the child said, no, I could not see your pajamas. I could only hear what you were saying. Mm -hmm. What a story. Yeah. What an inspiration to try it. Yeah. And the lady said, what was your favorite food? And she said, I didn't get any food. That's great. That's great. So, you know, so you're asking about, you know, the life. So it's it's really what is very, very important, of course, is to is to communicate with the unborn child. Uh, the more you communicate with the unborn child, uh, the more you help develop two things. First of all, you help develop their brain because we all know that without input, there's no output. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you, you have to, you have to stimulate the brain. Uh, the brain will develop um, no matter how little or how much you stimulate, but the more you stimulate, the better, of course, without overdoing it. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, you are also establishing an emotional reaction, an emotional relationship. Sorry, not a reaction. Uh -huh. Emotional relationship. Let me tell you another brief story, may I? Mm -hmm, please. I was I was being interviewed in California, um, and um, this woman said to me, you know, um, when I was pregnant with my firstborn, I, uh, my, my husband was studying medicine and he was hardly ever home. With my second one, that was four years later, he finished his studies, he was home every night, he would speak to my baby. I said, what would he say? You know, like, what do you say to a baby, uh, to an unborn baby? And he said, she said that he said, uh, oh, he talked about the dinner we had, the weather, and then he would always end his sort of little talk by saying, see you tomorrow, Junior. Well, when the baby was born, my husband walked in, she said, he came towards me within a few feet, he raised his hand. He said, hi, Junior. And my little boy just looked at him and gave him this tremendous smile of recognition. Like there was no doubt that this child recognized the father. And P.S. what happens later is, she said, now several years later, the relationship between my second child and my husband is so much better than the relationship between my firstborn and my husband. And mm -hmm. she was sure, and I agree, and I'm sure you will agree too, uh, that this was due to the fact that they bonded prenatally. Mm -hmm. so I think in terms of the psychic life of the unborn child, it's a very rich life. Now, uh, a great deal of the time the baby is sleeping, but when the baby, when the unborn baby is is awake, it's very important to talk to him, to sing to him, to play music to her, uh, and all those things that you would do with a real born child. And then that child is going to be better developed and healthier, excuse me, and happier. I'm happy to hear this information because uh, uh, with my wife, we have two daughters yes. and we have been singing to them, talking to them, and we enjoyed it. We just say, well, we want to, we just already have another member of family, so she belongs to us. And I'm happy to hear that uh, it has more sense 
uh, it has even a scientific sense and uh, that it works. That's great. Absolutely. It works. It works. And, uh, you know, like uh, my, my, my daughter, she sort of followed uh, the prescription in my book, The Secret Life of the Unborn Child. And uh, she had wonderful pregnancies and the children are all well. And it, it really, you know, it works. Uh, can we briefly touch the very difficult topic of birth? Yes. Uh, if it is difficult, if it takes a long time, if it needs special, I don't want to say invasion, but some special actions, yes. Uh, yes. how it change everything, the relations, uh, the approach to world, uh, approach to life at all? Yes. Um, at, at one time uh, in, in my medical studies. Um, I was studying in Toronto, as I've told you. And um, at, uh, at a certain point in my studies, I think it was in the, my fourth year, uh, I spent uh, one month on the obstetrical wing of, of a hospital as part of my uh, education. And I delivered 26 or 27 babies. I forgot it, the exact number. But I absolutely, I absolutely hated the way obstetricians were treating the women. Mm -hmm. And they would yell at them and they would shout at them, push, push, push. Um, it was, it was so unfeeling, so inhuman uh, that it really turned me off obstetrics and, uh, I finally went back to sort of my first love, which was psychiatric. And then in my work, I have sort of brought the two of them kind of together, my two interests, obstetrics, mm -hmm. psychiatry. Um, and I think what is important about birth is that um, you should you should only you should only be surrounded by people who love babies. And by people that you have a good relationship with, mm -hmm. and you are in the presence, let's say, let's just, for example, have the presence of a mother uh, that you don't really get along with very well, but you feel obligated to have her present because she wanted to help you, so to speak. Uh, but you really don't have a good relationship. My advice is don't have her present, Okay. Uh, anything that is going to increase stress for the woman while she's delivering the baby is going to interfere with the delivery. So only have good people around you, loving people around you. Uh, play your favorite music. Do everything you can to decrease the trauma of birth. It doesn't have to be traumatic, but it's one of the things that we have very little control over. We don't have control over how big the baby is going to be. We don't have control over how big uh, the woman's pelvis is. I mean, these are things that cannot be changed. But what you can control is your stress level and the people who are delivering or being present at the baby. Uh, now, the other thing is that having said all that, and if if there is if the birth is traumatic, I don't know how your children's birth was, mm -hmm. but if if you have bad luck and the birth is traumatic. The one thing we have to remember is that children are very resilient. Mm -hmm. And if the thing you have to remember is that if there was trauma, perhaps that child will need a little bit more affection, a little bit more care, a little bit more love than perhaps a child who was born under less stressful circumstances. But love, affection, sensitivity, um, all those things can make up a lot for the loss of normal birth. So, you know, it, it, it's, not, uh, it, it, it's not a time to throw up your hands and say, oh my goodness, you know, this is going to be a traumatized child and a traumatized person for the rest of their life. No, we can do a lot of healing.
All right. Now we are just touching and opening so many topics. I am sure that thousands of mothers are now thinking and asking, having many questions. But today I want to talk more and touch the topics that you are focused on. Because during the time, I think maybe that you have it maybe in your destiny that you are uh, swimming against the current uh, quite usually. So... <laughs> Then you started to thinking about the brain and yeah. about connection of brain and body. Right. What topic? Right. Well, you see, in terms of what we have just been talking about, I indicated to you that when I wrote the book, uh, we had a lot of, oh, we didn't have a lot, but we had enough research for me to write the book and to make it scientifically sound. But I was always bothered by the fact that there were people around who seemed to recall events which happened before six months of pre- of of of, uh, of of in, in I got it. yeah okay uh, I've I've had people who seem to remember their conception uh-huh. now if I had talked about that you know even ten years ago well even today. Uh, I have a little bit of trouble having it accepted. But if I had talked about it 10 years ago, I would have been laughed off the surface of the earth because nobody believed that you that a person could remember anything uh, that early on because we all know the brain is not developed at that point. Mm-hmm. So it always bothered me that I could not explain that. Like, I, I... I've always believed I have always believed that when people tell you about their experiencing, uh, I assume that they're telling me the truth. Mm-hmm. And so if they are telling me the truth and if they do remember things that happened to them, and in some cases even before conception, then I would like to know how that happens. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. So, like I say, you know, that that always sort of was in the back of my mind. I would like to, I, 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 I'm attracted to enigmas. I'm attracted to unexplained phenomena. Mm-hmm. And then seven years ago, seven years ago, I read in one of the medical journals, one of the medical journals about a uh, Frenchman 42 years old, who had developed some weakness in his leg. And he went to see his doctor, and the doctor did all kinds of tests. One of the tests they did was to take a skull x-ray. And to everybody's astonishment, it turns out that this man had virtually no brain. He had water. He no had water. He had hydrocephalus with a thin crest of brain tissue, a very thin crest, perhaps no more than what would you say five to ten percent of his brain, of his cerebral hemispheres was mm-hmm. present. He was a married man with two children and working in the French civil service. Mm-hmm. Whatever we may think of the French civil service. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, But still it needs some level of consciousness. <laughs> so, you know, I said to myself, how is this possible? This doesn't make any sense. But it's there. Yes. It's there. Uh so there has to be an explanation. So then, you know, once again I, I started researching. And I found actually quite a lot of research uh, and studies um, on children, for example, who had epilepsy, and they had to have like half of their brain removed in order to remove the seat of the epileptic seizures. Also in adults, the same thing. Uh, people who have been in major accidents and have had some part of their brain removed. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them continued to live perfectly normal lives. Mm-hmm. So 
I thought, again, you know, how is this possible? Then I read about heart transplants mm -hmm. and how um, some scientists have shown that recipients of heart transplants often will change their personality mm -hmm. to be very much like the personality of the donor. Uh -huh. There are these reports in the literature, for example, um, where where a, a young woman got a heart transplant. She didn't know who it was from because that's always kept a secret. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually of someone who died, right? Uh, but she totally changed her gender preferences. She used to be um, gay. Uh, suddenly she developed a liking for men. Uh, she used to be a vegetarian. Suddenly she started eating hamburgers. Uh, and she also complained of once in a while feeling like something was hitting her chest. Mm -hmm. and freeze. Well, eventually she found out who the donor was. The donor was a young guy who died in a motorcycle accident. He was hit by a car and he had all the characteristics like loving his meat, uh, being heterosexual, all those kind of things that she developed as a result of the heart transplant. Mm -hmm. So I put those two things together and I said to myself, there has got to be memory in other parts of the body beside the brain. Mm -hmm. There have got to be cells in our bodies, tissues, well, tissues, are tissues, organs, cells. Cells are sort of like the atoms, right, mm -hmm. of, uh, of our bodies, the, the sort of smallest uh, discrete particles. And so I said to myself, cells in our bodies must be acting like when you have a backup system on your computer. So, yes, the computer is primary, but there is a backup system. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if your software or anything breaks down, you can go to your backup system and you can reclaim the documents that you have lost on your computer. And so I began to look into, into how cells actually work. And then... I discovered that cells are the most amazing, the most amazing mechanism uh, that nature has ever devised. And so when they work together, uh, it, they, they, they really create a, a kind of linked, unified, um, multi-level homeostatic memory system um, with the embodied mind and not just the unsculled mind. In other words, we have for such a long time, and part of that is the patriarchal system that we have inherited from bygone times before even the Greeks. The patriarchal system always, always focused on the head, mm -hmm. the head of the clan, the head of the family, mm -hmm. the head of the country, right? It's all head. And medicine and science has sort of unconsciously adopted that. And so we have put all this sort of stress and all our loyalty, if you like, to the, to the head. And we have elevated neurons to, to, the, to the special status. You know, the neurons are the nobility of our cells. But again, looking into research and looking into cells, neurons are really no different from any other cells. They are just more specialized. But the same thing that neurons do, cells can also do electrically. And mm -hmm. so this, of course, you know, takes, takes quite a bit of time to explain in the book, which, which I do and I will in my lecture in a couple of weeks in Prague. Uh, but... Essentially, you know, neurons are really cells in the body are no different from neurons. It's, it's just like cardiac cells are more specialized than liver cells, than kidney cells, than neurons, but they all essentially contain huge spaces. Again, it's something that the average scientist and certainly not the average person 
can understand, but you know, uh, there is no cell in the body that is visible to the naked eye except the ovum, okay, the egg cell. Mm -hmm. The egg cell is the only cell in the body which is visible. It's as large as a dot on a printed page. Yeah. But all the other cells <laughs> are tiny. So you figure, well, how can anything, you know, how can anything be contained in those cells? But there's a tremendous amount of uh, stuff, proteins, um, DNA, RNA, uh, water, uh, all kinds of all kinds of tiny little apparatuses, um, which uh, which are just like the larger um, organs in our bodies. Okay, so for example, there is such a thing as mitochondria, which are the lungs of mm -hmm. the cell. Mm -hmm. Etc. Et so, um, you know, there is tremendous amount of space in, uh, relatively speaking, in a cell, and so there are several possibilities. Uh, I don't know for sure. I cannot say where memories are lodged in a cell. Uh, some people think it think it's in the cell membrane. Some mm -hmm. people think. Uh, that it's in microtubules, which are another tiny little structure in uh, in the cells. We don't know yet where there are, you know, several several theories on that. But all I know for sure, all I know for sure is that this linked cellular system is part of our brain, so to speak, our mind, our consciousness. All of that really is connected to to the body and so why why is this important so you know practically speaking okay you know it sounds interesting i hope uh theoretically but you know is there a practical point here yes there is um for example i mean i could go in a hundred different directions but let's go in one everybody worries about alzheimer's right so Half of the drug companies in the world, medical doctors, neurologists, they're all working to find what it is in the brain that creates these amyloid, um, these amyloid deposits that get in the way of the brain working properly. But, but uh, researchers in Australia, at the university in Australia, discovered that actually the liver produces amyloid tissue uh -huh. and so if we were to pay attention to that and prevent in some ways the liver a from producing amyloid and b from having it deposit having it traveling to the brain interfere with the uh, amyloid tissue arriving in the brain uh, we could perhaps do a lot on Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. but that, but that would take that would take an understanding that the brain is connected to the rest of the body, which you know, I mean, everybody knows in some ways, but they don't really follow it. Okay, uh, they pay lip service, as we say in English, they pay lip service to it, but they don't really understand it. Let me give you another another example. Very, very, very important. Um, we have discovered that the gut contains a huge number of good bacteria. These are these are not bad bacteria. These are very, very important. Yeah. It, it's called the gut microbiome. We have five pounds, five pounds of bacteria and viruses in our gut. Mm -hmm. They are incredibly important. So, for example, in in my own uh, in my own profession, you know, we, we we prescribe antidepressants to people. And in spite of what the drug companies try to tell you, they only work in about one third of depressed people. Uh -huh. In one third of depressed people, they work really well. One third they don't make a difference, and one third have to stop taking them because they have side effects. Mm -hmm. okay. Why don't they work in the other two thirds of people? 
Well, one reason is that there are certain gut bacteria in some people that destroy that destroy the antidepressants, and that's why they don't work. Mm -hmm. So, if we were to pay attention more to the gut bacteria and devise methods in which we can identify what you your gut bacteria for example how your gut bacteria differ from mine and whether your gut bacteria will destroy antidepressants or not then we could really go ahead but that would mean that we have to think of the whole body instead of just the brain again antidepressants people talk about you know serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh as if that was the answer. It is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is just one of many uh, factors that play a role in depression. There are many, many others. So, you know, I could go on and on and on. There are just very, very many drugs and diseases that are not, that perhaps take their expression in terms of brain dysfunction, uh, but they don't necessarily start in the brain. They mm -hmm. start in other parts of the body. So instead of just talking about psychosomatic medicine, which is popular, mm -hmm. we really have to understand what it means, what it what it really means. It it doesn't mean, you know, like I was taught and, and medical students are still taught that when you feel stressed, you produce an ulcer. So what does that mean? It means that you send some signals from the brain down to your gut, and then the gut deteriorates as a result of it. It's one way from upstairs to downstairs, okay? It's not from the bottom up. It's all from the top down. And what I'm trying to tell people is that it works both ways, okay? It's mm -hmm. not really revolutionary. It's just trying to bring attention to the fact that it's a two-way process, that everything is connected. Everything is connected. And so what happens in the gut affects the brain. What happens in the brain affects the gut and every other organ also because everything is connected. And so we really have to become much more holistic in our understanding of health, and then we are all going to do much better. Speaking of stress, let me just throw in one more thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about stress. Everybody knows that you, when you are stressed, you know you don't do very well. Uh, you get more sick, and we can look into that. You know why your immune system goes down. But one of the very interesting new discoveries, and again, very few people know about it, is that actually there's a hormone in your bones called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin, osteocalcin really, really is a very major factor in the stress response. If you didn't have osteocalcin, you wouldn't have a stress response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, just like as I was saying about the liver and the amyloid tissue, here we have a totally different part of our body, not in the brain, but in your bones, perhaps a bone in your leg or in your arms that is producing this hormone uh, that will make a difference in terms of the stress response. So, you know, that's, that's of course, you know, one way of, of making use of this new embodied mind theory uh, that I'm proposing. Uh Honestly, I must say that at the beginning I became to be a little bit afraid. Oh, man with no brain. Oh, it sounds strange. Uh, uh, but it's impossible to throw it away from a table. And a few, just a few years ago, discussions about the microbiome have been very categoric. Oh, it doesn't make sense. It's crazy. But it's not crazy. And it's proven. It works. It tastes like that. But it's proven. It's proven. Uh, and research has shown that, for example, people who uh, are socially isolated have 
uh, a very different microbiome than from than people, particularly older people who interact with other people are more social. And the difference is diversity. If you have a diverse microbiome, uh -huh. this is so simple. And, and I hope that our listeners hear this because a diverse microbiome makes you wiser and more socially adept. Mm -hmm. And research to show this, you know, I'm not making this up. So, you know, once again, we have to look at every part of the body and how it contributes to your psychological and physical well-being. What is the response when you have your paper on a conference and when you explain these theories? It's very good. It's very good. I'm not I'm not meeting any of the hostility that I met in the 1980s when I first proposed that unborn children, you know, are 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 not totally senseless and ignorant. Uh, no, uh, I think there's much more acceptance of that, and and perhaps also because you know uh, everything that I say, I, uh, I I back up. With, with research from some of the best universities in the world. So it's it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to oppose it. That is great. You know, uh, I'm proud of my audience. These are clever people. There is no hate speech beneath my videos. There are discussions and development and putting just on collecting information sources. And I can't imagine now what all may happen because uh, uh the the part when you have been talking about just the psychic life of unborn child uh when we have been talking about the delivery uh then uh, when we are just talking about uh, two-way connection inside our body so many topics uh, so many points which i feel really personal it touched me in every moment and in every sense so uh, how to finish? Uh, your book, uh, Embodied Mind, is going to be published in Czech Republic, if I'm right. Yes, in two weeks, yes. And you you are going to be in Czech Republic uh, probably on 12th of March, is it right? Uh, yes, that's very close. Let me check exactly. I'm arriving a little bit earlier uh, to spend a few times looking around Prague, which is a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I'm arriving in Prague on the 8th, Wednesday the 8th. All right. Right. And then in the evening, we'll go to the opera to see Rusalka. Uh-huh. And then uh, Thursday, Friday, sightseeing. And then on Saturday the 11th is the uh, one-day seminar and the signings, uh, signing of the book, uh, which is being published. All right. So I will publish this video just uh, in advance uh, before you came. And I will put there the link uh, for people who want to meet you personally. Oh, let yes. them have the time, let them have an opportunity to yes. go and listen it personally from you because it's every time much better to have a personal connection. Oh, it is. Let me just tell you uh, who the. Do you want me to tell you who the publisher is? Uh, you can say it. Definitely, yes. Okay, so the the publisher is uh, is Karel Svoboda, mm -hmm. Bohemica Books. All right, all right. I will put the link to the book as well to this video. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your time. I am fascinated, and I am looking forward to read your book because I am sure that I will have thousands of other questions after that. <laughs> will, will you come to the conference? I hope yes. I hope that I will come. Please, uh, when, when you are there, then, you know there may be a lot of people. Please come up and say hello. It will be my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye for now. Professor Verney, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion, uh, for this interview, and I wish you all the best for your next work. Thank you. It was truly a pleasure. I enjoyed meeting you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the end. As I said at the beginning, join the discussion. I look forward to the debate. If you click subscribe, you will get information about other interviews and it will help me as well. 
Have a great time and see you next time. Your Peter.